Peter's experience of grace as we're dealing with these appearances of Jesus to his disciples after the resurrection. And uh, we're in John chapter 21, but uh, we'll give a little bit of intro to where we are here with this message today, because it all ties together from where we've been. Uh, and uh, Peter's experience of grace is something that, that we all have noticed. We've uh, heard messages on it. We've, uh, we've been uh, given opportunity to, to hear the stories and everything else. But, you know, why does Peter need grace? Well, quite honestly, this is because this is a disgraced disciple. A disgraced disciple. The story goes through so many things that, that were true of him. He was bold. Matthew 20, 14, 28 to 29. Lord, if it's you, Peter answered him, command me to come to you on the water. Remember that story? And so Peter stepped out of the boat when Jesus said, come. And Peter started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. Bold. Well, of course, we know he began to sink when he got his eyes off of Jesus in that story. But, you know, another feature of Peter is that he was confident. And we, we have them in the upper room, and they've, they've at the Last Supper and the foot washing and all of those things. But we have this in John 13, 37. Lord, Peter asked, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Now he said similar things in other places, but he was convinced that he had it in him to give his all for his Lord. He was confident of that. But then Jesus challenged him on that in the very next verse, John 13, 38, Jesus replied, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, I tell you, a rooster will not crow until you've denied me three times. Well, he was sure that he was going to make it, though. As they left the upper room, as they moved on court toward the Garden of Gethsemane, as there was the time in prayer, and then as there was the... Uh, the betrayal as Judas pointed out Jesus in the dark and greeted him with a kiss. And Peter stepped up with a sword. And it says in John 18, 10, then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's service and cut off his right ear. Well, it might not have been the whole thing, might have just been the end of it, but uh, whichever it was this, was, this was Peter trying to stand up, trying to carry, carry through what he had promised, trying to lay down his life for his Lord. And there, when you're faced with, with a, a battle stance, and you have the soldiers and the guards and the crowd and everything else, and you have your Jesus to protect, and you come charging in, and you have a sword, well, you're going to take charge. Peter perhaps thought, well, th if this is the end, this is the end. I'll lay my life down and I'm done with that. But Jesus said, no, put that away. Put that away. Put that away. This is not how this is going to come down. And so Jesus allowed himself to be arrested and he was led off. And he went then, he was led off to the uh, house of the high priest. And that's when Peter became afraid. He followed just sort of. John and Peter were together through this time, and, and uh, Peter had stayed outside, and John had gone inside because he was known to the household. And then he went and told the, the, the gal that was at the gate, he said, go ahead, let my friend in here. And as he let Peter in, we have this, the servant girl in John 18, 17, the servant girl who was the doorkeeper said to Peter, well, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? I am not, he said. Uh-oh, here comes the trouble. His fear got in the way. He was asked again if he was 
Jesus' disciple? And he said, no. He was asked again if he was Jesus' disciple, and he was rather detached. Matthew 26, 74 says that he started to curse and to swear with an oath, I don't know the man. Separating himself from Jesus. And immediately the rooster crowed. That's when Peter was disgraced. And this disgraced disciple then remembered the words that Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Oh, he thought he could stand up to it. He thought he would be able to hold through. He thought he would go through to the end on this. But, you know, even though Peter had tried to be the man of the hour, he had tried to be the sergeant of arms, he had tried to be the protector of his Lord, but then fear overtook him when, when things didn't go as he expected. The interesting thing is that he was still considered part of the group of the apostles. They hadn't, they hadn't discounted Peter yet, but, but Peter had a lot of conflict going on within himself. He knew what he had told Jesus. He knew what he had planned. He knew where he was, and he wasn't in that place where he wanted to be. But we discover why Peter hadn't been dismissed from the rest of the group. The truth is they had all deserted. Mark 14, 50 says, they all deserted and ran away. So everyone had gone away from Jesus. They'd all deserted Jesus, and yet still they'd all stayed together. What else were they going to do? They only had each other to lean on at this point in their life. Their, their Lord, their Master, their Savior was taken away, was in trial, was soon standing before um, Pilate, uh, had high priest demanding his life, and finally was committed to crucifixion. And they saw the results of that as their Lord died on the cross, as he was taken down by Joseph of Arimathea and by, um, by uh, uh, Nicodemus and laid in a new tomb. And the rock sealed over the entrance. But then there was that resurrection day. There was that resurrection day and, and Mary had been there first and she found the tomb was open and she ultimately ended up connecting with the Lord. But right at first, she found the tomb empty and she went and she went to tell Peter and John. They were roommates at this time, I think, because in John 20, verse 2, it says, So she went running to Simon Peter, to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they've put him. Well, so we know they were still hanging together. And then we find out as the story goes on, uh, as as uh, Mary had had an encounter with the Lord and he was, was able to go back and said, I've seen the Lord. We find out that there's 10 together that evening. And John 20, verse 19, when it was evening on that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Well, there they were all together, 10 of them. Judas wasn't there, and Thomas wasn't there. But there in their sorrow, in their worry, in their wonder, they were seeing Jesus. What do you do with this? What do you do? How do you process this? And they were finally, again, commissioned as Jesus' apostles. Apostle means one who is sent. An apostle is one who's sent on a mission, like an ambassador. That's why the word ambassadors for Christ is used 
used. That's why uh, Paul talks about we are ambassadors for Christ. Jesus commissioned these who were in the upper room, hanging together, wondering behind their locked doors if they were going to survive this. He said in John 20, 21, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So they were recommissioned. They were given their mission back again. But so far, they didn't know what to do with that. Even though the next thing that happens, they were given the Holy Spirit power and given discernment, given the opportunity to reach out, to stretch out, to do more than they ever thought. And we have it in John 20, 22 to 23, after saying this, he breathed on them. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. If you retain the sins, they are retained. Well, that's discernment about what God is doing. That's not the power to do it. That's the Holy Spirit giving them, though, the power to go into all the world. As Jesus has sent me, so I send you. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Well, the thing is, this, this, so far, this didn't, this didn't make the difference for them. Just the next week, Jesus again appears to them. They're still in hiding. They've seen the Lord. They, they haven't been able to process what this means. Jesus showed up, this one who died, this one who was buried, this one who was apparently raised from the tomb, this one who appeared behind the locked doors, this one who even ate a piece of fish in front of them, uh, according to one of the records of that. They were still hiding away. They were still locked up, wondering what was going to be next. And because Thomas was not there the first time, Jesus showed up while they were still trapped in their worry and their fear and their wonder. Just the next week, Thomas was there. John 20, 26, a week later, his disciples were indoors again and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Well, that was the second time Jesus appeared to them and gave the greeting of peace. And then there's the third appearance. And that's really where our story is framed even for uh, this part of the record. I've already talked uh, about a couple of other features of this story, but it's, it's really important that we understand how this process is working out because this is a real story about Peter confronting grace and why he needs that. In John 21, verse one, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. And that's the introduction to the story, you know, and the story um, has to do with them fishing all night and those them not catching any fish and all those other things. Why was that? They were still lost in their grief. They were still struggling to accept their mission and their buried mission needed its own resurrection. Not just their Lord to be resurrected, but even their mission to be restored and resurrected. And we have it uh, in this, John 21, three. I'm going fishing, talked about this already. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said to them, and they all said, we're coming with you. And they went out and they got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. But you know, this is when we're reminded that Jesus had called them to be fishers of men, and they decided they were going to go back out and catch fish instead. And so that, that first call, of course, we have it in a variety of places. It shows up in Mark 1.17 from the very beginning. Follow me, Jesus told them, and I will make you fish for people. I will make you fish for people. Follow me was what was said in the very beginning of the gospel and it's not the end of the story. Well, 
they had gone fishing and they had gone fishing trying to trying to find themselves and they discovered that the net was empty without Jesus. They were called to be fishers of men. They didn't quite process what that was all about yet. They went fishing like they always had done and they came in with an empty net. Jesus asked from the shore, friends, you don't have any fish, do you? Well, that's sort of a sort of a presumptive question the way it's asked in that statement, is it? Well, no, we don't. You don't have any fish, do you? Well, how about if it was a statement, not a question? Jesus said from the shore, you don't have any fish, do you? Well, no, we don't. Well, that's when Jesus got involved and they threw the net in on the other side. The net was full by Jesus' command. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat. You'll find some. So they did, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. This all ties in to that original call, I'll make you fishers of men, and to the idea that without Jesus, the net is still empty. And for us to remember that when Jesus commands us, the harvest will be more more than we can understand, more than we can take in. And that is because Jesus was reviving their purpose, reviving their purpose. I will make you fishers of men. And in fact, here he even invited them in John 21 10 to come and bring some of these fish you've caught. Come back into the purpose that I originally gave you. Jesus was inviting these disciples back to a fellowship with him again, back to fellowship with Jesus. He even said, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples there to ask him, who are you? It said, because they knew it was the Lord. But, you know, that was, they, they were still lost in their wonder and their worry and their fear and their, their sense of direction. And Jesus was making this become more real. But what we have here is John making a note that the third appearance is now in the book. John 21, 14 says, this was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So you've got the first in the upper room, the second in the upper room, this third by the Sea of Galilee. And now the focus begins to shift a little bit because as this focus shifts, we move on so that we might understand a little more about Peter's own experience of grace. And Peter really needed this. He was, he was kind of leader of these, uh, these 12 beside Jesus. He was the one that was next in line to keep them all together, to keep them focused, to keep them moving forward. This, this uh, lot of variety of different backgrounds, many were from were fishermen, some most were from Galilee, but some were not. And Peter had been their leader, but now he had been disgraced, at least certainly in his own heart, certainly in his own life. And we need to understand that Peter himself, when he realized he denied his Lord that third time, felt the great despair of that. And he felt the disgrace of that. And Jesus wanted Peter back again. Jesus wanted Peter to take that role that he had designed for him. Now, Peter, I think at, at this point, was pretty worried about his actions. There were broken promises. There were fear that kept him away. There was his heart that kept him in the group but, but there was this, this wonder about what would Jesus think of him? Okay, the other, the other brothers, are, they're used to these ups and downs of life, you know, and the ins and outs. But what would Jesus think of him? He promised he would die for him. He would lay down his life for him. And he wouldn't even admit that he knew him when push came to shove. What would Jesus think of him? And Peter's experience of grace begins with a with an important question that comes from Jesus. And basically the question is, how's your heart? How's your heart? In John 21, 15, it begins with this. 
When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, there's a lot of uh, sermons that get made about the, the three times that Jesus asks and the difference of the word used for love and the responses. I, I'll, I'll just cover the last piece of that a little bit, but it's not the real point. Jesus was saying, are you willing to give your all in your love for me? And Peter said in his response, well, I think I'm good. Jesus was saying, how's your heart? Peter said, well, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. I think. <laughs> Peter's trying to sort himself out. And so here's your mission, Peter. Feed my lambs. You have a job to do. You have a job to do. Feed my lambs. All of that is in John 21, 15. But then... There's a second time that Jesus does the same thing. In John 21, 16, it says the same question. How's your heart? A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter, well, responded, um, you know, I, I still think I'm good. You see, Peter needed to dive in a little deeper in order to come to the point where he was ready to be fully used. John 21, 16, the second phrase in there says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And so here's your mission. Shepherd my sheep. So feed my lambs, shepherd my sheep. This is your mission. But they're not done, because now there's a third time. And we wonder about the one, two, three here, but you know what? Peter's denials came one, two, three, all in quick succession. They were all done in, in a very few minutes, according to the way the story goes on outside the gate. Peter was recognized by the girl at the door. She, he was recognized along the by the fire, by two different people. And he did everything he could to distance himself at that point from Jesus. But well, Jesus was now bringing him back in with the one, two, three of saying, Peter, do you love me? Have you figured it out yet? Well, Peter was responding at first to that idea that Jesus says, I love you. Do you love me the same way? Peter wasn't quite able to answer that because he kept responding, responding um, yeah, yeah, I'm your brother. And finally, this third time, when Jesus asks, how's your heart? He says, Simon, son of John, verse 17, do you love me? Am I really your brother? It comes out that time in the Greek. Am I really your brother? How's your heart? And that's when Peter confronts his guilt. And that's an important, interesting part of this. How's your heart, Simon, son of John? Do you love me? Peter confronts his guilt. It says that Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? And this third time, instead of saying, giving him the option for full unfettered love, Jesus narrowed it back down. Are you really my brother? And Peter had to confront his guilt. He was grieved. He had finally gotten down to the core of what he was feeling. And that's when a humble heart becomes an honest heart. Now, this is something we challenge with, uh, we're challenged with all the times ourselves. We're, we're sure of ourselves until we're faced with the kind of challenge that makes it impossible for us to remain sure of ourselves. 
Peter had done that when he was asked if he um, if he was going to stand up for Jesus or not or deny him three times. Do you know him? Jesus denied the Lord just as the Lord had said. He felt the bitterness of that. He felt the 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 uh, disgrace of that. He thought he had dealt with this in the appearances of Jesus. But you know, when you look at the stories, Peter's still eagerly standing back, as I might say. And you see that on the shore of the lake here in the earlier part of this story, when the, 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 uh, the catch of fish is, is gained and Peter jumps out of the boat and runs toward shore, leaving the others behind to drag the net in. But he still doesn't quite approach Jesus until Jesus says, bring me some of the fish you have. And Jesus go, or Peter goes and in his eager excitement, in his eagerly standing back, he runs and he grabs a hole in that and pulls it in. And then Jesus invites them to breakfast again. He's been eagerly standing back. He thinks that he's good, but the truth is he needed to confront his sense of guilt so that he would be able to understand what Jesus' gift of grace was all about. Lord, you know everything. See, G Peter at this point knew that he couldn't make this call himself. He knew that he was wavering. He knew that he had tried to make promises. He wasn't able to keep up with those promises he wanted to make. And even this time, as Jesus asked him a third time, he was remembering those thir three denials. And Jesus was trying to, or Peter was trying to say, yes, yes. And now he says, I hope so. I hope so. Lord, you know everything. You know how I love you. And that's when Jesus poured out his grace upon Peter's guilt and said, Peter, your mission hasn't changed. Feed my sheep, he says in verse 17. Now, Peter needed this gift of grace he needed this, this calling back into the presence and the purposes of Jesus. He needed to know that this one that he had distanced himself from, this one that he had denied even knowing, was going to allow him to serve him in the mission that was ahead. And so you had three denials. You had three invitations. Three times the mission is restated, but it is that last time where Peter puts it back into, into the heart of Jesus. You know all things. You know how I love you. And Jesus said, good, here's your mission. But then he didn't leave it at that because he was about to tell Peter that following him is costly. And we have to remember that. Peter needed to know that, that uh, following him is costly. It, it was costly before. He was, Peter wasn't quite ready to face the cost. Jesus had even challenged Peter about that in John 13, 38. Uh, will you lay down your life for me? Will you really? But now, at this point, Peter's resolve was ready. He had humbled his heart. He had put it back in Jesus' hands. He had received grace to cover his guilt. And so J Peter heard these words from Jesus. In John 21, 18, truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you 
and carry you where you don't want to go. See, the thing is, the old life before Jesus is yours. And Peter was kind of being told that in this, in this verse. You know, your old life was yours. Truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. Your old life before Jesus was yours. But now Jesus says your new life needs to be full surrender. When you grow old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you, carry you where you don't want to go. Your new life is, go is going to be full surrender. And that is for this reason. John um, 21 verse 19 is going to tell us this. He's going to go to glorify God even to the point of death. He said this to indicate by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. In your old age, you'll be tied and taken where you don't want to go. But then that's when Jesus said, don't fade in your faithfulness just because the course is going to be difficult. Because John 21, 19 ends by saying, after saying this, Jesus told Peter, follow me. Mark chapter 1, verse 17, Jesus said, follow me. John chapter 21, verse 19, Jesus says, follow me. Don't fade in your faithfulness. It's going to be costly. You are going to end up where you never wanted to go, but you can do this by your grace. Peter's experience of grace had happened because Jesus had a purpose for him. He had said, Simon, Son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told them. He had been invited to fellowship. He had been called to examine his heart. He had received his purpose. He had been advised of the cost, and he had been invited back to full discipleship. You know, for each of us, we've had those challenges of our own resolve compared to Christ's purpose for us. And Jesus wants us to not fade in our faithfulness. He wants to, us to hang in there. We have the story of Peter's denials and Jesus invitation back because the Bible knows that that like Peter, we're going to struggle with our resolve to fulfill the mission that God gives us. Sometimes we're going to want to turn back. Sometimes we have to we have to face our guilt. Sometimes we have to face our failure. Sometimes we have to face our resolve. And Jesus says, I still want you. I still want you back. I still want you in the fold. Come back to fellowship. Examine your heart. How do you love me? There is a purpose. Go and tell the world of Jesus. And there is a cost. For at the end, if you will fully surrender to the purpose of Jesus Christ. God will be glorified, but it will cost you everything you have. Are you willing to do that? Jesus invites you to follow him back in fellowship. Come, follow me. Like Peter, you can hear that. Come, follow me. Whatever your, whatever your victories, whatever your failures, 
Come, follow me and feed my sheep. Let us pray together. Father, thank you that you know our hearts. Thank you that you love us anyway. Thank you that you have a purpose for us. And thank you that you give us second and third chances. Thank you that you want us, even though we failed you before. And Lord, help us to be honest and humble of heart so that we might serve you in the kind of way you want us to, surrendered entirely and completely to follow you no matter what as your disciples. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.